Who's excited this morning? Yes. Okay. Uh, we're going to work on that energy. Uh, ho- hopefully by the end of the sermon, you guys will be hyped. So turn your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1. That's going to be our primary uh, text this morning. Colossians chapter 1. If you are kind of old school and brought a physical Bible, that's, that's awesome. Uh, maybe you're a little more, more modern techie and you've got a Bible app. Uh, go ahead and pull that open. Uh, but if you did not bring your Bible with you or you don't have a Bible app, don't worry because we will have it on the screen so you can follow along. Although I always encourage you to bring your own Bible. Bible so that you can fact check me and make sure that what I'm saying is actually in the Bible. Uh, but but if, if you just want to take my word for it and trust me, uh, I, I appreciate your trust. And, and so hopefully, hopefully what I'm saying is actually in the Bible and I promise it is. So Colossians chapter one is going to be our text today. We're going to pick it up in verse 13. I'm going to read through verse 18. This is what it says. He, speaking of God, has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son and whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him, all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Uh, Several years ago, I used to um, work at Walmart. Uh, This was before we started the Verb Church, before I became a pastor. And so if you work at Walmart or you just work in retail in general, I'm praying for you uh, because I, I've been there, done that. And you have a special place in my heart. It, it's not fun, right? Uh, and so I worked for a bit at Walmart. And, and there was this uh, coworker of mine who, uh, he was about my age, uh, maybe a little younger than me. Um, and, and he was just a really cool guy. I mean, even to this day, one of the coolest uh, guys that I've known. And, and we just really kind of clicked uh, and got along. We had kind of similar personalities. Our sense of, senses of humor were the same. You know, I'm pretty sarcastic and he was sarcastic. And uh, so we just really got along. Uh, and it was one of those things that anytime we had the same shift together, we knew it was going to be a good day because we just laughed and goofed off and wasted time. And it, it was just, it was awesome, right? And so I, I, we, he, he became a really good friend. Uh, and until one day he got promoted and all of a sudden things changed because he was no longer my coworker. He was now a boss and he, he had responsibilities and he couldn't waste time anymore. And, and, and just kind of the dynamic of things changed and, and, and the relationship changed. And, and, and I remember thinking, man, like I, I liked, I liked Bob. That, that wasn't his name, but just, you know, I liked Bob as coworker, but but I don't like Bob so much as boss. He's, he's not as cool. He's not as fun, right? In, in the 90s, there was a, a popular Christian band called Jars of Clay, uh, and I think they're still active and making music, but they were really popular in the 90s, and they wrote this song. It was one of their, probably their most popular song called Love Song for a Savior, and in that song, there's a line that says, it's all too easy to call you Savior, not so close enough to call you God. It's all too easy to call you Savior, not close enough to call you God. And so here's my point. We like the idea of Jesus as Savior. We like that idea. Jesus as our Savior, Jesus as our friends, Jesus as coworker. Like we like that. And it's easy to call Jesus Savior. He's he's full of love. He's he's like a, he's fluttering around with pixie dust. And he's kind of this super chill hippie, you know, he's just, he's just full of love and grace. Like we like Savior Jesus, coworker Jesus, right? But we don't like Jesus so much as God, as king, as boss, Right, we we kind of struggle a bit when it, when it comes to Jesus being, being king. We, we struggle a bit with that. In fact, uh, look again what uh, Paul says in Colossians 1, 13 and 14. It says that God has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son and whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Now we like this, right? Sign us up for that. Right, the idea that Jesus has, has delivered us from the domain of darkness, brought us into his kingdom, he's redeemed us, he's forgiven us of our sins. Like, sign us up, we're on board for this Jesus. Like, we, we like Jesus as savior, as our friend, as our coworker. Right, but, but Paul goes on to say, 
Look what he goes on to say in verse 18, that in everything he might be preeminent. So why does Jesus save us? Why does he redeem us and forgive us of our sins? That in everything he might be preeminent. The reason Jesus has brought us out of the kingdom of darkness into his kingdom is so that he could be our king. Right? Jesus isn't so much interested in being savior alone or being our friend alone. He wants to ultimately be preeminent. The word preeminent is an interesting word. It means top, above, highest, greatest, strongest. Right? It's this idea that that if something or someone is preeminent, there is nothing above them. There is nothing higher than them. There is no equal with them. They are above all things. And this is what Jesus wants to be. And the reason he saved us and forgave us of our sins, the, the reason he brought us out of darkness into his kingdom of light is so that he could be preeminent. He wants to be king, not just your friend. He wants to be Lord and king. Now, now you might be asking, Ryan, who gives Jesus the right to be king, right? After all, I'm an American, right? I said no to tyrant King George and dumped his tea in the harbor, right? I'm an American. I have no monarch over me. And after all, I want to be preeminent. Like I want to be top, highest, greatest, right? Who, who gives Jesus the right to be preeminent in my life? Well, I'm so glad you asked that this morning because that's the rest of my sermon, right? So, so I, I really appreciate that it's really convenient that you would ask that. So what we're gonna do this morning is we're gonna essentially look at Jesus' resume. Uh, so if, if Jesus were to apply to be king of your life, although I would say that he need not apply, he already has the job, but just for the sake of argument, if he were to apply to be king in your life, what we just read in Colossians is essentially his resume, right? He's submitting to you his resume. What, what qualifies him to be preeminent? And we're going to look at four credentials this morning, the four credentials that qualify Jesus to be king. And so that's what we're going to do. So the first one that we see here in Colossians is that Jesus is God, Jesus is God. Look again what it says in verse 15, that he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. About a decade ago, uh, I lived in Amarillo, Texas for about a year and a half. Uh, has anyone ever lived in the Texas Panhandle or maybe just been there, like driven through? No one, a couple people? Like if, if I could characterize the Texas Panhandle by one word, it would be windy. And maybe second to that would be dusty, right? It's just dusty and windy, right? And so, uh, man, I lived uh, in Amarillo for about a year and a half. And before I moved there, I was warned that it's windy. Uh, but man, I, I got in for a rude awakening pretty immediately because within like the first two weeks of moving there, uh, there this one particular day, we had wind gusts up to 90 mile per hour. Now, now you need to understand that there wasn't a cloud in the sky, like this wasn't a stormy day, there wasn't a tornado. Like it was a day like today, just blue, sunny, just a beautiful day, other than the fact that up to like 90 mile per hour wind gusts. In fact, there was one of those green highway signs that blew off its frame because of the wind. And thankfully it didn't hit any cars or hurt anybody, but, but I mean, this was, this was just crazy, right? And, and, and here's the thing about wind, it's, it's invisible, right? You can't see it. It's not tangible where you, can, you can't grab it, you can't, touch it or hold it, but you can certainly feel it. You can see its effects. You can see the branches of a tree swaying in the wind. You can see the effects of wind erosion over a long period of time. You can feel the relief of a cool breeze on a hot summer day. So wind, you can't see it, you can't touch it, but you can feel it and you can see its effects. And I've heard some people say that God is a lot like wind, right? That, that you can't see him. He's not tangible and physical where you can touch him or hold him, but you can certainly feel him and you can see his effects. Now, some of you might have just a hard time kind of buying into that because you, you might say, why does God have to be like the wind? Why does he have to be all mysterious and, and, and windy, right? Why, why does he have to be like that? Why, why can't he just reveal himself, 
right? Why, and I hear this argument all the time by, by people that don't believe in God. Like if there was a God, why doesn't he just light up the sky, reveal himself in physical form and settle all doubt once and for all? Why does he have to be all mysterious? Why does he have to be like the wind? But my answer to that would be that God's already done just that. 2,000 years ago, God became flesh. He took on physical matter and dwelt among us and revealed once and for all who God is. This is why the Bible says he is the image of the invisible God. If you want to know who God is and what God looks like, look no further than Jesus. Right, just read through the Gospels and read about Jesus and you're going to see the clearest picture of who our God is. Right? He is the image of the invisible God. God, and he revealed to us once and for all who our God is. You see, Jesus wasn't just a prophet. You know, he wasn't just, he wasn't just a prophet that, that lived 2,000 years ago because uh, the majority of people will admit and say that there was a historical figure named Yeshua, Jesus, that walked the earth 2,000 years ago. Only kind of the fringes of people will deny that historical fact. There, there are historical records that this man actually lived, but some people might try to dismiss him as he, he was just a, a prophet that kind of pointed us to God. Or, or maybe he was just a good moral teacher that kind of told us about God. But Jesus wasn't just a prophet and he wasn't just a teacher. Jesus was God who took on flesh and dwelt among us. You see, the awesome thing that sets Christianity apart from every other religion, and if you study all world religions throughout history, the thing that sets Christianity apart is that every other religion requires you to climb the mountain to get to God. And every other religion essentially says that God's on top of this mountain and you have to ascend the mountain through your own good works, through your own moral behaviors, through your own efforts. You have to work. You have to climb that mountain. And only those who are the most holy, only those who are the most enlightened will arrive at the top of the mountain and see what God is like. But the, the thing about Christianity, what it teaches, what the Bible teaches us is that our God descended the mountain that he might dwell among us. And he took on flesh. He became a physical human being that he might reveal to us in the clearest form possible who our God is like. Right? He doesn't require us to climb the mountain. He doesn't require us to ascend the mountain by our own efforts and works. He left his throne, descended the mountain that he might dwell among us. And the Bible says he is the image of the invisible God. Jesus reveals to us once and for all who our God is. Right, this is good news and you should be more excited than that, but it's okay. I've got, I've got three, more, three more points here. So, so the first credential we see here is that Jesus is God. And if there's any qualifier for uh, someone to be king, that, it, that would be it. Uh, but we have three more. So, so the second credential that we see here in Colossians chapter one is that Jesus is creator. Jesus is creator. Look what it says in Colossians 1.16. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. Now, there's a, a lot of division in the world today, right? It, it doesn't take uh, long on Facebook for you to, to see that reality. And there's, just a, there's a lot of, everything's a polarizing issue, right? Everything, like we, we've lost the ability to agree to disagree. It's like everything's super black and white. I'm right, you're wrong, and you're evil for being wrong and not agreeing with me, right? I mean, that's just how everything's become, right? Everything's a hot topic. Uh, but, but I think probably one of the, the biggest hot topics of debate in the world today, it is inside this bag. All right, so, so inside this bag. Now, it's not a dangerous critter or an animal or anything like that, but, but what's inside this bag, in my opinion, I think is probably one of the hottest topics of debate in the world today. You want to see what it is? Yes. Sh should I show you what it is? Okay. This right here. Now, now if, if you can't tell what this is, or for those listening on the podcast later, this is a roll of tulip paper. Okay, so... So this, this is, uh, I think, prob now, now some of you are like, this is getting weird. <laughs> we we should have gone to that other church down the street, right? So, so you probably never thought you would see the pastor use tulip paper as a sermon prop on Easter. Truth is, I never thought I would use tulip paper as a sermon prop, but here we are. So uh, now let me, let me explain what I mean, right? Uh, th there, there's an ongoing debate 
of whether you hang tulip paper over or whether you hang tulip paper under, right? So, so let's just do a poll here, okay? Let, let's see how divided our church is. So, so how many of you, and I want you to answer boldly and confidently, right? As if you're on Facebook arguing with someone, just be bold, right? So, so how many of you are team over? That, that when you, that, yeah, man. Okay, okay, all right. I mean, oh, whoa, 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 okay. Hold on, hold on. All right, how many of you are team under? Oh, 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 man. Man, this is pretty, I, I was expecting it to be kind of 50-50, but we have almost unanimous. Okay, so, all right, all right. So, so here, here's the thing. Here's the thing. We can argue about this all day long, right? We, we can argue about, do you, do you hang tulip paper over? Do you hang it under? What are the benefits of, you know, we can argue all day long, or we can ask the creator of tulip paper himself, <laughs> right? So, so check this out. Check this out. This is, this is the U.S. patent for tulip paper. All right, which, which way is it hung? Over. Over. All right. Case closed. All right. So look. Look. Now, now for, for, those, for those few that, that voted under, I apologize. Um, I, I, don't, I don't mean to shame you, but, but, you, but you're wrong. Okay. Uh, we can agree to disagree except on this because you're just wrong. So, so we, we see here, right, according, according to the design. To, to, the, to the original creator, right? It's meant to be hung over. So we can argue, we can debate, but at the end of the day, if you ask the creator of tulip paper, that's how it's meant to be hung. All right, so, so here's my point. Why am I talking about tulip paper on Easter Sunday? This is weird, okay? But, but here's my point, right? In Genesis chapter one, the Bible tells us that God created everything. Right? And he said that it was good. Now, what's really cool about that word good in the original Hebrew, it means that everything was exactly as it should be. It's this idea that everything was in its proper place. Everything was working as it was designed to be. The toilet paper was hung over on the thing, right? Everything was just, everything was as it was meant to be. Everything was good. But then in Genesis chapter 3, humanity made a decision that we want to create the world how we want to create the world. We don't want to be in subject to the king. We want to be king. and We want to create the world our own way. And what happened? Evil and sin entered creation. Now, what's interesting about that word evil in the original Hebrew, because when we hear evil, we think of like black magic and witchcraft and demons. Right? But what's really interesting about that word evil, it's essentially the opposite of the word good. Because where good means that everything is where it should be, everything's functioning as it was meant to be. The word evil means that everything's broken, everything's fractured. It's this idea that things are out of alignment, things are out of place, out of whack, kind of think the limbs are out of socket, so to speak. And so this is what happens when humanity says, you know what, we don't, we want to rebel, we want to be our own, we want to create our own world. Everything became fractured. Everything that was exactly as it was intended to be became broken and fractured and out of alignment. And this is why you see that this takes place in Genesis 3 and Genesis 4, there's already murder happening. And it just spirals out of control because when we decide we're gonna make we're gonna create, we're gonna hang the toilet paper under. Right? We're, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna create the world how we want to create the world. Things become out of alignment. Things become out of sync. Right? And ever since that day, humanity has basically been arguing the question of over or under. Right? Over or under. Do, do we do it God's way or we do it, we do it our way? But all we need to do is look back to the original design. All we need to do is look at the creator. And this is what Colossians 1 says, that Jesus, he created all, all things were created by him and for him. And so this is what's really cool about Jesus, is not only was he the image of the invisible God, revealing to us once and for all in the clearest picture possible who our God was, but Jesus also revealed to us who we were meant to be. Jesus was like the original prototype, that original design of creation, and this is why when you read through the Gospels and you read of all the crazy things Jesus did, he's you know, forgiving his enemies, he's loving people, he's, he's doing crazy stuff. Not only is he showing us this is what God's like, but he's also showing us this is who we were created and meant to be. And so this is why here at the Verge Church, we're, we're so passionate about Jesus. And if you hang out here long enough, you're gonna see that. 
that, that we, we are just passionate. Everything we do is about Jesus. And the reason is, is because Jesus is not only showing us what our God is like, he's showing us who we were meant to be. And, and he's putting those broken pieces back together. Right? We're not a perfect people by any stretch of the means. Right? In fact, we're kind of a hot mess here. Right? But, but that, that's a beautiful thing because if you're a hot mess, you just, you'll fit right in. Right? I mean, we're, we're, not, we're not a judgmental people because we just know that, that, that God's still putting the pieces back together. That, that things were broken and fractured and, and kind of out of sync and out of alignment. But piece by piece, little by little, Jesus is just putting us back together, right? Because he's the creator and he's still creating even to this day. Amen? That's awesome. So, so Jesus is creator. All right, credential number three. Not only is Jesus God, not only is he creator, but number three, we see that Jesus is eternal. Jesus is eternal. Look what it says, Colossians chapter 1, verse 17, that he is before all things and in him all things hold together. There are uh, kind of essentially three phases of growing up, three phases of maturation. So the first stage is kind of the, when you're a child and, and it's what I'm calling the arguing phase. Right, because pretty much fresh out of the womb, you come out arguing, right? And, and because we're, we're just hardwired to where we want to be preeminent, right? Everything's about us, and, and we just grow up as children because we, we don't really have the power to rebel, right? We don't really have the power to, to do anything about it, so we just argue, right? And kids argue, right? Everything, why, 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 why I don't agree with this. Why, these rules are stupid, right? So you're kind of in that arguing phase, but then you enter into the second phase in your teenage years. You, you enter into the phase that I call rebellion. Right, because all of a sudden you, you realize, look, ever since I was born, I've been arguing. I'm tired of arguing. It's not changing anything. So I'm just going to start rebelling. Right? I'm going to start kind of trying to pave my own path and do my own thing. Right? That's the rebellion phase. And then there's a third phase that you enter into in, in, in your 20s, um, and especially once you get into your 30s. And I'm calling it the repenting phase. Because it's, it's you, it's, you kind of have this day of epiphany where you realize, oh, man. Mom and dad were right this whole time. And I was an idiot for arguing, right? I mean, the, the, and some of you, maybe you're teenagers and you're like, oh, pff, no, not me. my parents really are idiots. But I promise you that that day's coming when you'll, when you'll realize, man, I was, what was I thinking? Like my, mom and dad were right the whole time. Why? Because you realize that they were, they preceded you, right? Before you existed, they existed and they themselves had been through the arguing phase and then the rebellion phase and then they went to, into the repenting phase where they realized, oh, we were stupid. Our parents knew what they were talking about. And, and, and you get into a point where you realize that, that as, you, as you start adulting, right? And responsibilities come on you and the, the soul crushing weight of life comes down, right? And you just realize, man, like mom and dad were right all along. Maybe not about everything, you know, maybe not about everything. They, they probably weren't perfect, but, but by and large, I mean, uh, they, they, were, they were pretty smart. They knew what they were talking about. Right? In the same way, this is what the Bible says, that Jesus was before all things and he holds all things together. Right? So I'm 33 years old. I'm about to be 34, which that might be come as a surprise to some of you because I look a lot younger than what I am. People all the time when they find out I'm a pastor, like, how is that possible? You're like a child with a beard. I don't understand. So, uh, but but I'm I'm 33, about to be 34. So I'm 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 you know I'm not old. I'm still young, but I'm not a spring chicken either. You know, and, and so it, it's like I've been around a little bit. I've I've experienced some life. I've traveled a, a little bit. I've I, I'm educated somewhat. You know, I was homeschooled. You know, so uh, take that for what it means. But you know, it's like so, so it's like I I, I I'm you know I, I can kind of boast maybe a little in the fact that you know I've experienced some life. But, but God has always been and always will be, right? God, before all things, Jesus existed. And look, long after I'm dead and buried, Jesus will still remain, right? So, so how arrogant is it of me to argue with God, right? To take this kind of position of, of uh, like they did in the Garden of Eden, right? This, this attitude of, I wanna pave my own way. I wanna do it my own way. I don't wanna do it your way, God. What an arrogant position for me to say, I, I know better than God, right? The Bible is just, it's outdated. It, this is, it, it is we, we've made progress. This is 2019. Come on, like, I, I know better than God. How arrogant of a position is that for me to take? I'm 33 years old. God is eternal. And at best, if I live to be 100, I mean, that's pretty awesome. 
I hope, hopefully I'm like super wise if I live to be 100. But even then, it's a blip on the radar compared to Jesus who has always been and always will be and he holds all things in his hands. So this is why we, we, as Christians, we trust in God's wisdom and in his ways, right? Now, we don't always agree. <laughs> it doesn't always make sense. In fact, I'll be the first to tell you that, that I'm often left scratching my head wondering what God is up to. But, but we, we trust in God's wisdom and in his ways because we trust that, that since Jesus was before all things and since he holds it all together, that maybe he knows a thing or two that we don't. Maybe he knows something that's above our pay grade, right? And so we learn, we, we trust, even though we may not always agree, even though I find myself sometimes arguing and rebelling against dad, but at the end of the day, we, we learn to trust in his wisdom and his ways because he is eternal. He has a perspective that we will never understand. He sees everything that has ever happened and everything that will happen all at once. And it says he's holding it all in his hands. Like Jesus is eternal. That's pretty, pretty awesome. So, so that's credential number three, right? G Jesus is God. Jesus is creator. Jesus is eternal. And then number four, this is gonna get good. Are you ready for this? Jesus is alive, right? I mean, it's Easter Sunday. You should have seen that coming, right? Jesus is alive. Now, now you might be like, well, that's kind of a weird thing to put on a resume. Like if you go in for a job interview and they're like, well, I see here that you put that you're a living, breathing human being. Like you're, you're a warm body. Like that's, I mean, that is a qualification, but it kind of goes without saying, right? It's kind of a weird thing to put on. I don't really have any skills, but I'm alive. At least there's that, right? But, but here's the thing. Jesus is alive because he rose from the dead. Right? The Bible says that this same Jesus that walked the earth 2,000 years ago is alive and well today, sitting on his throne, and one day he will return again. Right? Jesus is alive because he rose from the dead. Look what it says, Colossians 1 verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. When a king dies, a, a common saying, a common phrase that people will, the people will say is, uh, the king is dead, long live the king. And what they're saying is that, that the king has died, but he lives on through his lineage, right? His son will now take the throne. So, so the king is dead, but long live the king. Right? And on Good Friday, right, we, we say the king is dead. But, but on Easter Sunday morning, we declare in victory that long live the king, right? And it's not because Jesus died and some new Jesus kind of took his place. It's this same Jesus that died on Good Friday has rose in victory and is seated on his throne. Long live the king, right? Jesus is alive. And I really wish you guys were alive this morning as well, but that's okay. So <laughs> the, the resurrection, the resurrection, and I'm gonna keep preaching until you guys get hyped. So I mean, we'll, <laughs> I mean, I got all day, I don't care. So uh, the, the resurrection is paramount to our faith. And you might even, if you're a skeptic this morning, which by the way, if you are a skeptic, you're like, I don't know if I believe that, you're welcome here. Like you don't have to uh, believe right away. You just, just it, you're, you're welcome here. This is a safe place. So, so um, if, if you are kind of skeptical of this, you're like, oh, okay, I don't know. Like uh, it, Jesus being God, maybe Jesus being creator and eternal. Okay, but this, this, this thing about Jesus rising from the dead, you can't actually believe that. Well, I do believe it and I must believe it because look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul makes this crazy statement. Look, he says, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Those are pretty heavy words. This is what Paul's saying. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, we are wasting our time this morning. We might as well pack up our bags and go home. Next Sunday, there will be no church. We can just sleep in go to Sunday brunch, right? I mean, because this is a complete waste of time. And not only that, you are still dead in your sins. There is no hope, right? I mean, this is crazy, right? What Paul is saying, why? Why is the resurrection so paramount? Well, let me kind of walk you through this just really quick. And I promise I'm, I'm getting close to a conclusion. Um, but but this, is, this, is, this is why this is so important because in the Garden of Eden, right? When humanity rebelled and sin and evil kind of fractured everything, Right? Sin brought death. In fact, we see that one of the primary consequences of sin was death. In fact, part of that original design was there was no death, there was no decay. 
right? We were, we were meant to live forever, right? But sin brings death. And so what Jesus does on the cross, his death conquers sin, right? And this is what Jesus did. It's almost like he took sin to battle. And although it looked like he lost because it killed him, what he was actually doing was absorbing all of the sin. He was absorbing in himself all of the evil. He was taking on the penalty and the punishment. And so on the cross, Jesus defeats sin through his death, which is awesome. But, but then on Easter Sunday, through his resurrection, Jesus defeats death. Right? You see, death was a consequence of sin. So, so the full picture of the gospel is that through Jesus' death, he defeats sin. He defeats evil. But through his resurrection, he defeats even the consequences and effects of sin. Death itself. Right? I mean, this is, this is the full picture of the gospel story. And this is why Paul says the resurrection is so important. Because if Jesus did not rise from the dead, you're still dead in your sins. There is no hope. We can't take the middle ground that some try to take that, well, maybe Jesus, his resurrection was kind of metaphorical. It wasn't an actual resurrection. It was a metaphorical resurrection. But Paul's saying, look, if, if that's true, if Jesus did not actually rise from the dead, we're still dead in our sins. Je Jesus only did half the work. But this is, this is the promise that we have in Jesus that his, sin, his death conquered sin, but his resurrection conquered death itself. Jesus reversed the curse. And so this is why Paul goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 20. So, so he says that if, if Jesus has not rise from the dead, this is futile, we're dead in our sins. But then he goes on to say, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. That, that phrase, first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. First of all, Paul loves to refer to people, like Christians who have died, as fallen asleep. It's like when we, when we die, it, it's, we're, we're taking a nap, right? It, it's not permanent. But one day we will be woken up. And Jesus was the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Paul says in Colossians 1 that he's the firstborn from the dead. This is the promise, this is the hope that we have in Jesus that through his resurrection, not only did, did he defeat sin and evil at the cross, but when, when he rose and came out of that tomb, he defeated death itself. And there's this guarantee, it's like he's the down payment, the guarantee of our future resurrection that though we might die, we're just asleep, right? And one day we will rise again and we will live forever just as we were meant to live. You guys are still not hype. I'm gonna keep preaching. All right, so... Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and ask the band actually to, to come up as we kind of wind this down. They're gonna come up and start playing. I'll move my tool paper out of the way for them here. But this is why we pledge allegiance to King Jesus. And this is why we pledge allegiance to King Jesus. This is why we make him preeminent because you see he's offering us life. His resurrection offers us life and not even just life after death. Right? Not even this future resurrection, this life after death, but he offers us the fullest life possible even now. Right? Check out what Jesus himself, these are the words of Jesus in John chapter 10, verse 10. Jesus says, the thief comes only to steal, to kill and destroy, but I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Right? The, the, the thief the sin and evil comes to steal and kill and destroy, right? That's the consequences of sin. But Jesus says, I've come to reverse all that. And I came that you may have life and have it abundantly. Now, th this is where things get really cool. I want you to, I want you to hear me. It, th th that word abundantly is an interesting word. If you look in the original Greek, because the Bible was not written in English, right? The Old Testament was written in Hebrew. The New Testament was written in Greek and it was translated to English. Unfortunately, sometimes things do get lost in translation a little bit that the kind of the, the original punch gets missed, right? And so here, here's what's really, really interesting. That word abundantly, it means, it means, I have to look at my notes because I forgot. It means over and above, right? It means superior, extraordinary, surpassing. And it sounds a lot like preeminence, right? Preeminent, that means top, above, highest, strongest. So this is the promise of Jesus, that if we make him preeminent, he will give us abundant life. And if we make Jesus top, he will give us life that's above and beyond. If we make Jesus highest and greatest and strongest, he will give us life that's surpassing anything that we've ever experienced. Right? This is why the Bible says that in Jesus Christ, we are seated in heavenly places. Like even now, 
Like we are seated. What does that mean? We have authority. We have position in Christ Jesus. We have abundant life. And this is the promise of Jesus, that if we make him preeminent, if we put him in that highest place, then he will give us abundant life that's surpassing, that's overflowing, that's greater than anything you could ever imagine. And so this morning, I wanna give you the opportunity to make Jesus preeminent. I wanna give you the opportunity to, to put Jesus on the throne of your heart and to receive that offer of abundant life. Now, I do wanna say this because I, I, what I'm not saying is that if you follow Jesus, if you become a Christian and you go to church every week and read your Bible, that life is gonna be amazing, right? Jesus isn't like Pedro, right? Vote for me and all your wildest dreams will come true. Right? That, G, G, that's not what Jesus is saying. When, when he talks about abundant life, he, he's not saying that you're exempt from suffering. In fact, Jesus himself said, in this life, you're gonna have trouble. So what, if, if I were to tell you that if you follow Jesus, you're always gonna be healthy and wealthy and happy, I would be a charlatan selling you a lie. That's not what I'm saying. But what I can tell you is that even in the midst of sorrows of life, even in the midst of trials, even in the midst of hardships, that there, there's gonna be this joy unspeakable and full of glory. That there's gonna be this life that's overflowing even in the midst of that. And this is the offer that Jesus has. If you make me preeminent, I will give you abundant life. If you make me top, above and beyond, I will give you over and above life, life that you never imagined. So I wanna give you the opportunity to make Jesus preeminent. So with every head bowed and every eye closed this morning, Maybe you're here today and you've never had the opportunity to make Jesus king, to make him Lord of your life. Maybe you're here this morning and, and you've had that opportunity. Maybe you even done it in the past, but since then you've kind of dethroned him and you've put yourself in that position. But this morning, I just want us to surrender our hearts, pledge allegiance to King Jesus, put him on that throne this morning. So I'm gonna pray a prayer uh, and, and I want you to pray this prayer after me. Uh, the prayer isn't anything special. It's not magic. It's not an incantation. It's just words. But, but if you mean them and believe them with your heart, the Bible says you will be saved. And so I'm gonna pray this simple prayer and just repeat this prayer after me if you wanna make Jesus preeminent. Dear Lord Jesus, I am a sinner and in need of a savior. And I acknowledge that you died on the cross for my sin and you rose from the dead to give me life. And this morning, I wanna make you preeminent. I wanna make you king of my heart. I pledge my life to you. In Jesus' name, amen.